up on the screen, and if you want to open up your, your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 12. This section of Scripture is, is not the easiest to just pick up and read, uh, but as we follow it, think about all of us at various times in our lives have been challenged to do the right thing, from the pulpit, through our friends, through our family members. And how do we react to that? That's a little microcosm of what this section of Scripture is. So I'll read it. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret. It leads to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of your wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender nor for the sake of the one offended, but that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. We continue our study this morning, our series, looking at the Beatitudes titled, What Does Jesus Want Me to Be? Last week we began Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 by examining what it means to be poor in spirit. We must understand that because of our sins, we are, each and every one of us, spiritually impoverished. The next beatitude, though, in verse 4 says, Blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You know, at first glance, something seems a little contradictory about that, doesn't it? You know, we talked about last week that that word blessed also means happy, and here is Jesus saying, happy are those that mourn. That just doesn't seem to match up. It seems to be two different things that you can't be at the same time. What does that mean, though? How can I be happy and mourn? Remember that these Beatitudes, they build upon each other. And we will truly understand them when we view them through that perspective. So we think about last week and we saw that we chose to sin and that led to spiritual poverty. When I see the sin in my life, when I understand that it was all chosen by me, that it is all my fault, when I see that God had to suffer the death of His only Son, when I understand that Jesus had to go and to die that horrific death upon the cross because I made those choices, I realize that all of God's suffering is my fault. Completely my fault because at some point in my life I chose the devil over a loving God. Such a realization should break our hearts. We shed tears when we see people mistreated in this life and rightfully so. But where are the tears for the unbelievable mistreatment of God? a holy God, by the sins that we choose to commit. 
Those that are poor in spirit should naturally mourn that part uh, in their sin that hurts God and impoverishes them. Paul calls this godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Beginning with verse 8, he says, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this this godly sorrow, has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves, to be innocent in this matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender nor for the sake of the one offended, but that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. I want you to take note there of the nine times that God ta- or I'm sorry, that Paul rather mentions the sorrow or the suffering of the Corinthians that they were enduring because of what he had told them in the previous letter. Paul had told the Corinthians that they were failing the Lord in many ways because of their lack of love and their rampant division. And I just believe and I know that that would be hard for any group of sincere people to hear. What does Paul say about this godly sorrow? First, he says that godly sorrow is according to the word of God. Verse 10, for the sorrow that is according to the will of God. The mourning that comes from a realization of sin and its cost can only come when a person understands what God's word says in regard to that. A person's not going to have a realization of their sin until they hear something about God's Word, about God's standard, about what they have violated. The Word of God is that which enables us to understand sin. It is that which enables us to understand the price that had to be paid because of our chosen sin. You know, this is godly sorrow. Sorrow brought on because of a love that we have for God. In contrast, Paul speaks to those who have the sorrow that the world produces, and we see that oftentimes. This sorrow is produced for worldly reasons. Maybe I'm just sorry I got caught. There's a lot of times as a teenager, I wasn't nearly as sorry for what I did as much as I was that my mom or dad caught me. And so sometimes we're sorry that we just got caught. Sometimes we're sorry because uh, whatever we've done or whatever we've chosen has brought negative consequences to our lives. And so we're sorry because of that. But such sorrow has no value. And Paul ultimately says in verse 10 that such sorrow only leads one place. It only leads to death. David, King David, in Psalm 51, was mourning the sin that he committed. The sin that he committed when he... uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba and then tried to cover that up and ended in the murder of one of his best friends, Uriah. That sin was revealed to David by the word of God through the mouth of Nathan the prophet. When Nathan told him the story about the lamb that the family had and the rich neighbor took that lamb and he killed it, even though he had plenty of lambs of his own but he didn't want to use his own. And David was so angry that somebody would mistreat someone else like that. And Nathan looks at him and goes, You are the man. And he had great sorrow. Why? Because of the Word of God. Verse 3 of Psalm 51, as he writes that psalm of contrition, he says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin, it's ever before me. 
Verse 8, he says, Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. You know, God's word had, had broken David that day. We look at other Psalms and he says that during this time and nearly a year passes between the murder of Uriah and this time that Nathan comes to him and, and he writes and says, I was like, I roared like a lion all day long. He was miserable. He said, your hand was heavy upon me. But God's word had broken him. And that's what God wants. In verse 17, David says that it is a broken and a contrite heart that God seeks. He said, if you wanted sacrifice, I'd offer it. But that's not what you want, God. You want a broken and contrite heart. Now, he was going to need to offer sacrifices to, to obey the law. But a sacrifice without the broken and contrite heart meant nothing. He said, that's what you want. You want my broken heart. My contrite heart. God seeks that kind of heart because it is the kind of heart that is willing to give itself wholly to Him. We look in Luke chapter 7 and, and, and Jesus is there in the house of Simon the Pharisee and one of my favorite stories as far as interaction with Jesus and, a, and, and someone that was just clearly known to be a sinner and the harlot woman comes in and she anoints his head and she anoints his feet and then she, she's weeping and washing his feet with her, her tears and drying it with her hair. Jesus tells her her sins are forgiven. And they're, they're bothered. They're bothered that he would even have anything to do with, with such a woman. And, and Jesus tells them the story about a man that was forgiven a lot and a man that was forgiven a little. And he says, who's going to love the one that forgave them? Well, the one that was forgiven more. He says, you're right. He says, he who has forgiven little loves little. And it's not that any single one of us has a little to be forgiven of. We all have a great deal to be forgiven of. The problem is, is how I view it. If I view that I have very little to be forgiven of, I'm pretty easy for God to save. I'm going to love God little. But if I understand the gravity, if I'm poor in spirit as we've already built upon, if I understand the gravity of what I've done and the greatness of my sins, then I understand I'm forgiven a lot. And my love will be proportional to the one that forgave. That was what was going on with this woman. She understood her sins. And she came and she put her face at the nail scar at the feet of Jesus Christ and she wept. And Simon said over there in his holier than thou mentality thinking that he was one of the good guys and he loved little and she loved much and she left forgiven. We must take an understanding from that. We need to each bring ourselves in mourning and tears to those nail-scarred feet and ask for the forgiveness and then love like we love nothing else in this world, the one who gives it. Giving oneself wholly leads one to what Paul says godly sorrow causes. And that's our second point, that godly sorrow motivates a person to change. Listen to verse 11. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. Godly sorrow caused a number of actions within the church at Corinth. It created an earnestness. He said, behold, what earnestness. Godly sorrow caused that. And earnestness simply means a hasty diligence. They were in a hurry. They were in a hurry to change. They weren't going to change tomorrow. They weren't going to change when circumstances got better. They weren't going to change when it was easier. They were going to change right now. Once they came to understand it, now was the time to make that change. Listen to the other statements vindicated themselves. They had an eagerness to clear themselves of the sin. They had indignation. 
They were angry about their failures. I don't know about you, I do get angry that I fail. I do get angry that I do things that I know I shouldn't do. Paul even said that, didn't he? I do the things I know I shouldn't do. I don't do the things I know I should. And he doesn't sound happy about it. Neither should we. When we fail God, it should cause us to be indignant toward ourselves. There should be strong emotions surrounding our realization of sin. And these strong emotions should motivate us to change. And this is what Paul says in verse 9 that this sorrow will lead us to. It will lead us to repentance. He says that they fear. They fear God because they've been convicted by His Word. And they believe that He'll do exactly what He says, both for those that are His and those that are not. They have a longing. They long to fix those things in their life. Some sins don't go away overnight. I don't know about y'all, but I, I have some that don't. They're difficult. They hang on. And so we need to long to destroy them. They had a zeal. They're driven. Driven to continue that change. And then I love the last one. Avenging of wrong. They took out their anger upon their sin. That, 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 in, in, you know, that, that indignation that they had, they focused it in a direction. And it doesn't need to be focused on other Christians. It doesn't need to be focused on other people. It needs to be focused on my decision processes. What I need to change. We need to take our anger and direct it not at pity, not at blame, but right at the desires that might cause us to struggle in this life. What did all that result in? Well, Paul said that they had demonstrated themselves to be innocent. How? Well, there's only one way to be innocent, and that's through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. They repented, they changed, and they were forgiven of their sins, which enabled them to be innocent in the matter. Back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. There is no greater comfort in this world than a clear conscience. Than a clear conscience brought on by the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Listen to David back again in Psalm 51, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Verse 14. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then what, David? Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. He wanted to be washed. He wanted to be clean. He wanted to know the joy of a clean conscience and forgiveness. This is what enables one to be happy through mourning and the comfort that those who mourn know that is from forgiveness. But that only comes when we know godly sorrow according to the Word of God according to the Word of God as it regards our sins. It's so much easier for me to look at somebody else's sins, for me to see what everybody else is doing wrong. Sometimes we put blinders on that blind us from our own problems and the things that we need to fix. This morning, if you are living in sin... It is my hope and prayer that you will be confronted by it from God's Word. And that you will be filled with sorrow. That you will mourn the fact that your sin nailed the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross. I hope that you will take that sorrow. That you will allow it to motivate you. And that you will come and sorrow to the feet of Jesus and allow Him to say as He said to that woman in Luke 7 your sins are forgiven what a glorious thing what a wonderful thing and in that you will find happiness and comfort how do you think that woman left how do you think she left after hearing Jesus tell her your sins are forgiven you. I think she found some happiness. 
I think she found the peace that she didn't have when she came in. Because that's what Jesus gives. He gives peace to those that will give themselves wholly to Him. He can save you today. And you know, the thing is, He really he wants to save you. I, I think people get this thing in their mind that you know, God really wants to send everybody to hell, and, 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 but He's given us this exception. But He doesn't want that. I mean, that, that's going to be our choice if we wind up going there. His choice is to save us. God does not wish for any to perish, Peter said, but for all to come to repentance. So He can save you today. He wants to save you today. And He will if you come to Him. Understanding what you've done. Knowing that He is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. And He's the only way to the Father. I hope that's what you want today. I hope that you realize from God's Word your need if that is the case. If you're not living your life as you should, whether you are a Christian or whether you're a person that hasn't obeyed the Gospel... I hope you realize what God's Word says about the life that you live. And if it's not what God says, I hope that there is a sorrow in you. I heard a preacher say one time, and I guess when I first heard it, I, I kind of recoiled a little bit. He said, if you're not living right today, I hope you're miserable. <laughs> well, that's not a thing a preacher should say. But I do. I hope you are because I hope your conscience is like on you like that God's, David's conscience was on him. And I hope you realize your need to change. We want to help you with that. If we can this morning, we hope and pray that you will let us as we stand as we sing. Let us reach out and give